to wait. Um, okay, Th this image is um, in my house right now. And this is an image just about um, intention setting. Um, because about two years ago, I wrote down on a little piece of paper somewhere embedded in there that I wanted to have a show at the Nerman Museum. <laughs> and, um, and so a year ago, Bruce contacted me, which is another funny story, but I won't go into it. But it, it ended up happening. And it's, as he mentioned, it's my first museum show, so I'm quite grateful for that. Um, so in terms of thinking about intentions, the other thing is um, it's a little text heavy in the first set of slides, so don't get nervous. It's just my personal cue cards to ground myself in, in some of these ideas that are related to my work. So if I think about it, the intentions and the ideas and the themes that are embedded in my work, um, a lot of my previous work has really been about creating art as an experience, as a completely immersive experience. Um, that was also hopefully thought-provoking. Um, <laughs> and my background is in design, so it has really influenced the methodology of my studio practice and how I look at the world and the content that I've been inspired to explore. Um, and it's informed by research, the power of the site, space, place, site specificness, site responsiveness in terms of volume, in terms of perception, in terms of feeling. Um, materials are often chosen and driven, the, the, the concepts drive the material choices, so you're going to see a lot of different material shifts in my work. Um, I, I use language, text in uh, a lot of uh, my work, and, um, and, and also uh, look to the quotidian, the everyday, as well as historical aspects that may be around, embedded in the site, or in, in terms of the idea and also just in terms of being a human and um, in terms of life that th these are the things that inform my ideas. So I had a little light bulb moment the other day. I was like, oh, I'm an artist who studied sculpture through industrial design. So I teach in industrial design at the University of Kansas. I studied industrial design in my undergraduate and graduate degree, but I was always a sculptor in a very misfitted moment. But it really influenced a lot of the way I look at the world and, 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 and think about things. So in the past, I'm really known for large scale, immersive and very temporary artworks. And again, these works might exist for three months, three days, or three minutes. Um, and they often are tended to be on the extra large or the extra, extra large scale. So this is Curtain Wall. This um, site in downtown Kansas City was at the heart of the garment district. It was a curtain manufacturing um, facility. And so for Avenue of the Arts, a uh, three month or X amount of months public, temporary public project, I covered the six story building with, um, with curtains. Um, another project, Color Field, which was a part of a larger project called Field Test, um, cited work in the gallery, the community, the natural landscape, things shifted around in this environment in order to meet the public on their turf. So putting art into everyday life has also been a part of my practice. Um, there's Big Red, <laughs> Ford F-150. Um, and again, this motion of putting things in to the, the natural landscape as well. In this particular piece, this is a work that had lasted for three days, where I appropriated the building, the contents, and its workers for three days as an art object. This was the United Metal Spinning Company in Kansas City, fourth generation, metal, sheet metal workers. Um, and I could have made a sculpture out of the beautiful materials and processes that they, of the things that they create, but I, at the time, of in the news, you know, my daily drive and commute back and forth to Kansas City to Lawrence, you know, there was this talk about downsizing and the life and death of the American factory and the American worker. And I felt that I needed to work with those ideas rather than just make a beautiful object. And so, as I said, this was a piece that I worked on for about five years, not this physical form, but just the ideas of it. 
but it only existed for three days and it was inside their working factory. So this is a 80 foot table, 5,000 worker name tags because I deal with text and taxonomies and researched hourly wages of workers from around the world and so there's a, a, a narrative that runs throughout that table and that throughout the three days they were making bowls out of spun metal to be added to the table. There's a, there's a tool room and a machine room, but in, in, in the machine room where um, the guys are actually making these works, I built pedestals for them to stand on, imagining that at some day that the, the worker would become extinct. So like going to a museum and you're seeing these statues of people, you know, that, that the, the, the worker may actually um, become extinct. So um, this is Larry Brenneman Jr. and Larry Brenneman Sr. who are making the bowls that go on the work. In another installation, I um, was uh, thinking about sh uh, shopping as a patriotic act. It, it was connected to a very historical moment um, in, in time. And the, in this pr uh, work, retail therapy was at the Epstein Gallery. Um, and uh, utilized balloons to be serving as stand-ins for products in a big box store. So if we, if we could buy security or normalcy and relief and before and belonging and duty and if we could buy our inalienable rights of liberty, life and happiness. And when I went into major debt, um, because of doing these giant scale projects that often have a certain budget, but I, my vision is often much larger than the budget, um, I decided I had to stop making art on credit cards and um, utilize the balloons I had in my arsenal. So I um, worked on a project which is still ongoing called Product Placement, which um, takes these text balloons, which I see as kind of product surrogates, and as, as I, uh, and, and bringing them into urban, suburban, natural landscape settings and, and their temporary kind of public uh, happenings. This, this particular piece, um, oops, oh shoot, hello. Um, that the prior piece was um, called, uh, uh, it was on Black Friday, where I pushed the shopping cart from my studio to Costco on the busiest shopping day of the year. Um, this is product placement international export. This is me cramming them on a tram in Berlin. Um, uh, a s wonderful snowstorm at Costco um, in Manhattan, where I'm originally from, New York. Um, but again, there's other layers of embedded ideas that drive my work, but I just wanted to give a little bit of a, a visual context for um, how some of those ideas may or may not connect to the, the, this project that's in the gallery. This I dug up because it's one of the first things I did when I moved here 20 years ago, where I was intrigued by these pails, buckets, and cans at Home Depot. I was, I've been, I've had a fascination with sheet metal as well. Um, and, um, and as an industrial design professor, um, we were investigating various materials and processes. And the, at one point there was this understanding that all of the sheet metal uh, industries in the United States were um, being, uh, uh, dissolved because of the plastics industry. So plastic buckets were replacing the metal bucket, but then also industries moving across borders to create cheaper products because of labor uh, movement, et cetera. So pails, buckets, and cans really became a monument to manufacturing. And, um, and I went up to Winona, I you know, looked on the label, where are these made? Winona, Minnesota, research, make telephone calls, trek up there, bring photos, video, and I was able to spend time in the factory there, taking photos and video of the workers. There's some other video pieces of a, of a man making the same pail over and over and over and over and over again. But these are transfer images of, of some of the workers from past and present because the galvanization has existed for you know, over 100 years. 
So this leads me to Universal Boxes, the project that you see here in the Kansas Focus Gallery. And, and that's me. <laughs> so, so that's me, but that's also you, you know, in a way. And so when I'm thinking about the box, I'm thinking about it on, an, on a number of levels. And I, I put this in because I feel like the work here now is maybe some of the most personal work that I've done. And it's personal in the sense that um, the titles matter um, in, in this regard. A lot of my projects have had various names, like Curtain Wall, Retail Therapy, United Divided, et cetera, et cetera. So, and it's probably the first time I've made individual discrete objects which then create an art experience in and of its own. So, so you and me, me and you, the window, the well, the road, purgatory, say yes, look up. These are all places I've spent a lot of time in personally. And, and, and in thinking about the physical box as a physical thing, an emotional thing, a psychological thing, it's designed to hold, to hide, protect all the useless and useful contents of our lives and, and thinking about human compartmentalization. So there's lots of layers of thought that I've you know, just been thinking about as I've been making this work. And, um, and the, the work is really inspired by a place, which is the Lawrence Paper Company in, in Lawrence, Kansas. It's a 130-year-old family-run business that makes corrugated cardboard as well as packaging products. And I have had a 20-year relationship with them due to my, um, I teach a class called Materials and Processes, so I'm always looking to give my students eyewitness experiences of, you know, how things are made, you know, in this world. Um, and in my perusal of a packaging design um, book, I came across a chapter that uh, was about regular boxes or universal boxes. And that the, so I became interested in these kind of archetypal, universal, very standard forms in order to, to begin to build my work. And then the other personal layer of this is that um, each one of the pieces is, is, has a dimensional feature of my height. So I'm trying to give myself rules in this game as I'm collaborating with this, this company. And, um, and going back to the little nested doll of thinking about the box within the box within the box. Um, and so that leads me to the, the pieces downstairs. Um, and back to the factory. I, I mean, I could give an hour lecture just on the magnificence of this place because I find it fascinating. Um, it's, and I, I, for about two years, I really just spent time there as a uh, unofficial artist in residence, where I had a little, I have a little desk in the design prototyping area. And I really had to have, or have, free reign in the factory to take photos, video. And I just would think and write and sketch and look at those pack the packaging book. And, and so there's massive layers and stacks of cardboard everywhere. But because people don't believe me that those things actually turn into boxes there, I wanted to show you an example of just a, of a box that I have in my studio that when it starts to unfold volumetrically, it, it, it's, uh, its life starts here in the flat form. Um, and so, you know, again, I, I mean, every time I walk in, I'm like, oh my gosh, what did I miss? Because, you know, sometimes there's, you know, these red printed cardboard boxes rolling down the conveyor belt. And other days there's, you know, these other things around. And, um, and that to really understand that this paper comes from trees and that there's these inventory, these uh, warehouses of forests of, of these incredible uh, rolls of paper. So again, the environment I find incredibly inspiring, but I think it's this, this accumulation of materialness has informed uh, how I wanted to utilize the material 
with all of that stuff. I started a new workout program when I started this work. <laughs> um, and um, this, these, these pieces are made layer by layer. Um, they're composed of digital drawings that get fed to a, a machine, which I get to run in the prototyping area. And um, we cut out each individual um, sheet. And, um, and they get um, aligned and glued, and it, it takes a considerable amount of time and, and kind of a dance to, to um, get them together. Um, and then this is what it ended up to, to be. So I've been working horizontally for so long to, for, for me to be able to see them vertically in the gallery has been just such an amazing treat. Um, and I have a funny story about that very first big one that you saw, which was this, and you might not be able to see it, but there's a color break here, and this was the first and the largest piece that I was making. And, and in terms of the mathematical rules I was giving myself, I was taking an inch and dividing it into increments of eighth inch or quarter inch and half inch, and, and, and this was the eighth inch 86A. You know, I had you know, these numbers for them. Um, but it has a color break in it, and I ha was going to reject it because I just I couldn't live with that in my minimalist, purist uh, state of being. And but I thought, oh, I'll put it together later. I'll throw graphic on, I, on it someday and do something to it. Well, that happened on Monday <laughs> um, <laughs> to make that other piece that is happened um, in the in the lobby, which I'm really incredibly excited that it, that all piece also came to life um, in, in, in the exhibition. It takes a village. I'm not going to go through all of this, but I mean, I just want to really thank the Lawrence Paper Company, Mike Cordaro, all of the staff there. I mean, Bruce for making all of this happen, um, the staff here. University of Kansas and you know all my friends and, and family who have rallied and supported me you know, throughout this journey. So thank you.